I'm Christina May, the online pastor at World Harvest Church in Enid, Oklahoma. You're about to hear a spirit-filled message from our pastor. So grab your Bible, and if you're a coffee lover like me, grab a cup of coffee and get ready for a personal word that God has for you today. I'm gonna close out the series that we've been in for the last few weeks entitled Real Love. Real Love. And I, the Lord has spoken many different things to us through these last several weeks. We've covered a lot of ground about the true love of the Father. We are living in interesting times, are we not? Um, this week, uh, I had to turn the news off I don't know how many times this week. I'm just, I'm just tired of just the bickering, the, the divisiveness, just the ugliness. It's just, I, I don't know if anybody else is like me right now. It's just like, God, let's, we, we need something to move. We need something to change. Anybody else with me here today? There's so much uh, ugliness going on in our world. I don't think I've ever been in a season where I've seen so many people getting offended, so many people getting their getting hurt, um, so much separation, people, you know, planting their flag on their mountains, and this is the way it is, and if you don't believe the way I believe, then everybody else is wrong. Just a lot of ugliness going on, a lot of strife um, in our nation. That's, that does concern me, yes, it does. But probably as the thing that just kind of uh, chaps my hide, whatever that really means, I don't know. It's a red, redneck turn. I've never understood what it came from. Really what just irritates me more than anything is when that spirit that's of the world starts invading the church, when it starts invading our homes, our families, and our businesses. And as I look around today, I, I, I've got to say what I'm seeing is it's doing that. It's doing that. I don't know what your situation looks like right now, but it's just, it's not good times we're in. But this is what I know that the church as a whole, I'm not talking about World Harvest Church, I'm talking about the church as a whole, has never really done well in good times. But when we do fall upon bad times as we are really in right now, that's when it sh our light should really shine. That's when the church should arise. Amen? Um, I I've got something stirring in my heart here today. This is gonna be just a little bit of a different message than I normally would bring you know, usually I'm really bringing a precise message, three points, and just digging right in. But I'm just, just kind of really just want to just share some. I do have some things going to, some teaching portions, but I just really want to share from my heart here for a few moments this morning, and just to leave something with you. My encouragement to every one of us here in this room and those that are watching online right now is you, we better guard our heart more than ever before. As it says in Proverbs chapter four, we gotta guard our heart, come on, help me what? With all diligence. For out of it flows issues of life. And, and if we're not careful to guard our heart, we're going to fall into that nest that's going on in our world today. Matthew chapter five, you know, there's Matthew chapter five, Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter seven, that is what we know is the Sermon on the Mount there where Jesus is expounding to the people there just some very simple biblical truths there. And I want, I want us to look at it here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, because I believe that when we are in dark times, when we are in crazy times, when we are in times like we are right now, that we've got to be careful that we don't respond to the way the world responds, but we respond to the way that the Bible tells us to respond. In other words, we need to have a biblical response, not a selfish response, not a my view response, but we had to have a response of Jesus response. Amen? Come on, I want you to say that. Say, I'm going to respond the way Jesus would respond. Got to have a Jesus response, right? So I want us to look at something here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. It says this. Familiar scripture. You probably heard this before. You know, We even got a song in you know, in kids' ministry, talking about this passage right here, it says, you are the light of the world. Come on, somebody say, I am the light. You are the light of the world. You're like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Verse 15, 
No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, this is the New Living Translation, verse 16. In the same way, somebody say the same way. In the same way, let your what? Good deeds. Let your what? Good deeds shine out for all to see. Let your So what of it in our life produces the light? Good deeds. Thank you. I was hoping somebody was listening there. Good deeds. What are good deeds? Ge- deeds are our actions. In other words, the way we act. So according to this passage of Scripture, the way that we act produces light in this world that we're living in. Do you guys see that? Am I okay with that? Am I, am I tying those pieces? Is everybody okay? Come on, give me some response. Okay. So the way we act, not in church. Now, how many of y'all know it's easy to let your light shine in church? Yeah. I didn't see any fist fights before church. Now, I was in the back, though. It could have happened. All right. But it says, let our good deeds, let them light. Now, let me ask you the question, what, who produces light in this world? Is it Jesus? Sounds good, but no. The scripture does not say Jesus is the light of the world. What does it say? We are the light of the world. Do you guys see that? And what produces the light in us? It is our deeds, our actions, what we do. Amen? Everybody knows a simple analogy of a flashlight, right? A flashlight produces light, right? Now, when it's light out, how many of y'all know it's not really being that effective? But when the lights go out, come on, you really see the light, do you not? Yeah. So let me ask you the question, how bright is your light shining? Now, this is shining pretty bright right now. But if my light is dimmed, if my light has something obstructing it, if my actions are not right, if my actions are not pure, then I have got a little bit of an issue here. It's not shining as bright as it should. But if we live our life with Jesus Christ as the center of our life, if we make sure that there's no obstructions, if we're walking in the ways of Jesus, how much brighter does our light shine? Amen. Come on, look at somebody beside you and tell them, I'm going to let my light shine bright. Very simple Sunday school elementary principle, but church, why can we not do it? Why cannot we? Why can't we be light in a dark world? And I, I'm, I'm going to really try hard today not to get in the flesh, but I feel like I just need to speak some things today. Amen. Come on, we as Christians, we should be the answer to the problem, but not creating more problems. Come on, we should be bringing Jesus to the scene instead of creating more mess. And I tell you, I think it's a challenge for every one of us here today. Listen, that we have got to be a true light in the dark times that we're living in. Look over Matthew chapter 23. I want you to see something that Jesus says to the Pharisees. Do you realize that the people who gave Jesus Christ the most problems when he was on the earth wasn't sinners? The people that gave Jesus the most problems that kept button heads with was the religious people of that day, was the Pharisees. It was the church people. And I tell you what, I can almost identify with that because, you know, in our life of ministry here, 22 years in Enid, Oklahoma, pastor in World Harvest Church, do you know where we have the biggest issues, the people who has created the most problems for us is not the people outside of the walls of the church, it's people who inside of the walls of the church. It's the same pharisaical spirit still alive today, people judging people. They're wrong. I'm right. Let me get back on scriptures. I'm going to get a little carried away here for a moment. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. And I did lay my glasses down somewhere. Jonathan, run my glasses up here right quick. Don't want to miss anything. Matthew chapter 23, we see Jesus writing here. Oh, you changed quick. From the baptismal to the tie. You're looking good there, bro. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. What sorrow awaits you? Jesus is addressing the Pharisees. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites? He's not talking to sinners. He's talking to church people. People who are educated in church life. Educated in scriptures. He says, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb, 
gardens here. He says, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law. There's three things he identifies there. Come on, say them with me. Justice, everybody say justice. Mercy, everybody say mercy. And the third, what does he identify? Everybody say it with me, faith. Now, I love this because I don't, can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, tithing's not in the New Testament. Well, Jesus right here says, come on, read it with me. You should tithe. Now, I'm not here to talk about tithing today. I just had to point that out there. It's really good. I just love what Jesus said. You should tithe, yes. He says, but do not neglect the more important things. In other words, you can act like a Christian all you want, but if you're not doing it all, what good is it? Jesus said here, he says, what sorrow awaits you? What sorrow awaits you? Jesus identifies justice, mercy, and faith. I hit on this about three weeks ago, just real briefly. Justice is making things right. Making things right. That's basically, that's a short definition of what justice is. Making things right. Those of you who've been coming for a while know that during the shutdown, we have escalated our ministry into the country of Uganda, Africa. We've been minister. In fact, I got to minister again Wednesday morning. Got to preach the gospel uh, again to the people of uh, Africa. I think we had over 300 and some people gave their heart to the Lord on Wednesday morning. Man, praise God for that. There was, I don't remember the report from that. There were several uh, miracles that took place, but uh, it, it, was, it was a word that really brought some freedom to the people. But it, it was several weeks ago, those of you who was here remember telling the story, so let me just tell it real quickly um, just for those that weren't here. But our missionary there, David Kamanzi, uh, he they rescue kids from the dump. This is, we can't wrap our minds around this here in the United States of America, but uh, when you don't want your kids in, middle, uh, in third world countries, they'll, they'll just take them to the dump and leave them in the dump. And, and so they rescue these, ba- these kids. And so they'd rescued this young man from the dump many years ago. They didn't know his birthday, anything about him, so they said a birthday. So uh, several weeks ago, they decided to celebrate this kid's birthday. David's got a large family. He's got his kids and all the kids he's adopted. Well, his neighbors thought that they was having a big party there, and they were in the COVID shutdown restrictions like we are. Now, they're still limited, more limited than we are right now. So the neighbor calls the police and said, they're, they've invited all these people together and having a party. The police come and arrest them, and arrest them. Now, get this. Again, we, can't, we don't understand this in the United States of America. But they arrested David, and everybody in his family, all the kids except for his wife and his oldest kid, so his wife and his oldest kid could stay home to take care of the house. But they took David and all the kids to jail. For two days, they spend in jail, okay? Now, David, again, most Americans, we would be mad. We'd be calling everybody. I mean, we'd be calling for protest, all that. David, he says, you know, we're going to make the best of this. Long and short, the story is after two days in jail, they got 83 people saved in the jail, the kid delivered, and they came out of the jail. Listen, they came out of the jail realizing what the conditions of the jail were and so they immediately, over the last several weeks, they've been doing outreaches to the jail. They went in, uh, redid the bathrooms in the jail cells. They have uh, the, the, the ventilation system, put mosquito netting on there to keep the mosquitoes out, new doors on there. They're ministering to the jail. Let me tell you, they are trying to make things right that are wrong. That's justice. They're trying to be an answer, not creating more of a problem in that. I love that. Jesus said, you've, you know, faith is a given. We talk about faith a lot. We don't talk about justice and mercy very much in church. Jesus, he told the Pharisees, listen, you're you're acting the right thing. You're tithing. You're showing up. You know the scriptures. But you've neglected justice and mercy and faith. He's condemning them. Church as a whole, have we become the Pharisees of today? Are we neglecting justice and mercy today? It's just a thought. Just a thought. Over these last few weeks, we've looked at a couple stories in the Bible that I just, the Lord dropped in my heart hard and I couldn't get away from. Three weeks ago, we talked about the Good Samaritan. Anybody remember the Good Samaritan? Good Samaritan is found in Luke chapter 10. The setup of this is where a man, a religious man, comes to Jesus and asks him, you know, how do I gain eternal life? Jesus says, what do you see in the scripture? Uh, The man says, well, I see in the scripture, if I just love God and love my neighbor as myself, that's what I need to do. Jesus looks at the guy and says, listen, you got it, dude. If you'll just do that, you'll live. In other words, if you just do those two things, you'll make it. You'll be okay. Then the man responds to Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? Y'all remember that story? 
So Jesus goes into the incredible story of the Good Samaritan, how there was a man traveling down the road, he's beaten up, he's left for dead, thrown in the ditch. Everybody remember that? Who's the first person that came by? Anybody remember? The priest. The priest was like the pastor of the church. The priest, it says he looked over, he saw the man in his condition, he, decided, he didn't do anything about it. Um, maybe, uh, we don't know, but maybe the, whenever the man looked out over at the guy that's in the ditch beat up, I wonder if he thought, well, I wonder what he did to deserve that. You know what, if he had to been on this road, he wouldn't be in, in that situation. He refused to do anything. If there's somebody that should have had compassion on the man, it was the pastor, right? But it said there was a second person that came along the way, it was the church worker, the volunteer, the Levite. It says that the Levite come over, looked at him in the ditch. What was going on in his mind? And I just, I wish I could help, but I don't have time. You know, I wish I could help, but I don't want to get involved. And it says that he went on his way. But a third man came along, a Samaritan, a Samaritan. This is key that it's a Samaritan. Because a Jewish man and a Samaritan man, they didn't, they, you talk about racism in that day. That was, that was supreme. I mean, it was big time, racism. Samar- Jewish people did not interact with Samaritans. That's why whenever Jesus with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, the well, that's why that was a big deal. For Jesus to be talking to a Samaritan woman, oh my goodness. So the guy in the ditch, the Samaritan, somebody that most likely was a different belief system than the man in the ditch, somebody that most likely was a different political party than the man in the ditch, somebody that was most likely a different social status than the man in the ditch, yet it was the Samaritan, somebody, the the least likely person that you would pick from a lineup to say, that's the guy that's going to help the man in his pain, it was a Samaritan. The Samaritan, it says he took him, he bound him up, and he said he took him to the innkeeper there, and he told the innkeeper, here, here's two coins. He says, take care of this man, nurse him back to health. If you need any more when you come back, he says, you know what, I will take care of that. The theme of that story right there we see is that we've got to be like Jesus. Jesus said, if you will just do the same thing as he did, if you will show mercy, he says, that's what you got to do. So the theme of that right there is showing mercy to the hurting. And what is mercy? Mercy simply means compassion. That's what mercy is. Mercy is compassion. Compassion is this. Compassion, define it. I've got it there in your notes. Compassion is deep awareness of the suffering of another. It's coupled with the wish to relieve it. That's what compassion is. Look, at. leave it up there for just a moment there, Caitlin. Deep awareness of the suffering of another coupled with the wish to relieve it. Is there any suffering going on in our world today? Is there anybody hurting in our world today? Yeah. Jesus said the man that showed mercy was the one that did the right thing, the one that showed compassion, the one that showed a deep awareness of the suffering of another coupled with a wish to relieve it in that. Church, where is our compassion today? The second story we talked about last week was the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. In both of the stories, we, we see certain things. Let, let me, the prodigal son. Let me just recap that real quickly. It's the story of a young man who basically went to his dad and said, Dad, I want my inheritance now before you die. Think of that, a slap in the face of the father. In other words, what he was saying, I wish you were dead so I could get what's coming to me. So, Dad, instead of you dying right now, would you just give him what's coming to me? Really a slap in the father's face. The father willingly gave it to him, and he went out. And the Bible says he went out and he lived a wild life. I mean, he lived wildly. You know, for the Bible to call a lifestyle wild, how many of you know that's got to be pretty wild, right? But he got to the end of his rope. He got to a bad place. And the scripture says he came to himself. He had an awakening moment. And he said, if I could just go and just be a slave, if I could just be a servant in my daddy's house, my dad's servant's got it better than I've got it right now. Y'all know the story? Come on. He goes back to dad's house. Dad's not sitting back there waiting for him just to grovel at his feet. But dad meets the young man halfway there. He welcomes him home. The young man's got this attitude. Dad, I've messed up. I've sinned. I've made bad choices. If I could just come live in your house as a, as a servant. The dad says, no, you're not going to be my servant because you are my, you're my son. You're my son. He brought forth, you all remember the robe. He brought forth the ring. He brought forth the shoes. He restored the young man to the very position that he left. That's restoration. 
That's restoration. Let me tell you what the true, real love of God looks like. The love of God shows mercy where mercy is needed, but it also brings restoration where restoration is needed. That's the true love of God. It's in those two stories that we see the true love of the Father God. It's in the story of the prodigal son that we see restoration. Restoration brings reconciliation. Let me give you another definition for reconciliation. Recon- to reconcile means this. Reconcile means to restore to bring back into harmony. To restore, to bring back into harmony, reconcile. It's where we get the word to, you know, those of you that still operate a checkbook and still reconcile your checkbook. Come on, where's all my reconcilers that reconcile your checkbook here today? Some of y'all young people are like, what does that mean? I don't understand. I'm still struggling with that. I'm a reconciler, so I know the new way is just to get online and see how much money you got in your account. It's like, it's just hard for me to compute anymore. But if those of you that remember or that still do reconcile your checkbook, what do you do? You take your bank statement and you take what you have and you've got to bring it into what? Harmony. <laughs> and I don't, can't tell you how many times I'm like, man, the bank's wrong. The bank messed up. You know, and the more I dig into it, I'm like, oh, I realize I'm the one that messed up. I had to bring it into harmony. That's what it means to reconcile, right? So the theme of the Good Samaritan is showing mercy to the hurting. The theme of the prodigal son is restoration and reconciliation. The young man was reconciled. To the Father. Now, let me get where I want to get to. What in the world does this have to do with us, Pastor? I know you're thinking that, so I thought I'd ask the question for you. <laughs> Both of these stories, it gives us a roadmap to how we are to treat the hurting and the marginalized of our world today. The Good Samaritan story, we're to show mercy to the hurting, to those in pain. The prodigal son, we are to bring reconciliation, which brings restoration to the lost. So if that's really the way we're supposed to act, let me ask the question, how well did you do that this week? Did did you show mercy to anybody this week? Or did you just live for yourself? What, what, What did you do this week to help reconcile someone or a situation? Or did you just create more division this week? Remember what Jesus said back there in Matthew where the guy asked him what's the most important thing? If you just love God and what? Love people? Let's look at something Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter five. Y'all glad you came to church? I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. 2 Corinthians chapter five, I want you to see something Paul says. And I really hope you're hearing the heartbeat of the message today. 2 Corinthians chapter five verse 17 says this. This is talking again really about the love of God. It says, this means that anyone, verse 17, New Living Translation, this means that anyone, who's an anyone today? Come on, everybody, come on, say, I'm an anyone. Come on, say, he's talking to me right now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ, how many of y'all know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior today? Let me hear you today. That means you belong to Christ. He has become then I what? A new person. Come on, he's become a new person. The old life is gone. Come on, read the rest of that with me. What? And a new life has begun. I love that. If you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ today, your old life is gone. Come on, when you repent and when you come back to Jesus, like Jacob got baptized here today, the old man died there and the new man came alive. If you've done that, if that's you, let me tell you, the old man is gone. You're no longer gauged by your previous life. You're only gauged by you being a son or daughter of the Most High God. I don't know about you, but that excites me. Amen? Some of y'all, you were champion sinners before you met Christ. Come on, some of y'all should have got a gold medal in sinning before you came to Christ. Anybody with me here today? Yeah. It says the old life is gone. Look at verse 18. Verse 18. Come on, how many of y'all are glad your old life is gone? Come on, how many of y'all know Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior? Let me hear you today. Come on, let me hear you online. Good, I'm glad, because I set you up. If you're excited about Jesus being your Lord, I'm, I set you up. I, I baited you, because I want you to see what verse 18 says. And all this is a gift from God. I don't know about you, but I'm glad my salvation is a gift from God. I didn't have to work for it. I didn't have to earn it. It was a free gift. He brought us back to himself through Jesus Christ. This is the setup. God now has given us the task of reconciling people to him. 
Church, that's our mission, to reconcile people to him, to reconcile. What did the word reconcile mean again? Anybody remember? Bring back into harmony. See, our life in our sinful state was brought back into harmony with Christ, right? But now we've got a mission. We've got a mission to bring reconciliation to people of this world. We've got it out there on the wall, taking a real Jesus to a real world. But you know what that means? It means that we should be, be about bringing reconciliation. Reconciliation, bringing into harmony. So what would you suppose the opposite of reconciliation would be? If we was to do the opposite of bringing people into harmony with God, what do you think the opposite of that would be? Anybody? Would it maybe bringing division? Maybe taking people further away? Maybe not pointing people to Christ, but pointing people away from Christ? If we're to be the light of the world and our actions, our deeds is light, and we see in the scripture that we have a duty to reconcile. I'm trying hard not to put my, my dad hat on right now. What are we doing to bring reconciliation? This mess of getting online and throwing rocks, digital rocks at people has got to stop. That's not reconciliation, that's division. This, this mess of getting online and thinking everybody's got to think and act and do what I do has, has got to stop. It's not bringing reconciliation. It's bringing more division. Church, this is my takeaway for you. You know what a filter is? We've got to develop a filter in our life that we take everything that we do, our actions, through the filter of this scripture, the ministry of reconciliation. Everything that I say, everything that I do, I've got to ask myself, is this bringing reconciliation or is this creating more of a problem in my life? It's a filter that we, we got to walk by. Why? Because the scripture says if we're in Christ, we're a new creature, and now we've got a job to do. Well, pastor, who's going to point out everybody's problems? You don't need to be doing that. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. We're not called to be judge. Mercy. Showing mercy. Church, I need your help. I need your help. I really do. I'm serious about this. Showing mercy is something that I think we do that's a byproduct of taking a real Jesus to a real world. Our, our services, I hope that people encounter the love of God and that you, even like last Sunday, somebody you know, gave it to the heart to the Lord at the end of service. Where that's reconciliation. That's showing mercy, uh, the love of God. Uh, we've got things we do. Um, you know, we support, we got the Uganda ministry goes on right now. I mean, we, we're preaching on the radio by FaceTime. We're sending money over there, but we're not, we don't have boots on the ground, so to speak, here. We've got, we're partnering over there with the missionaries. We've got ministry in Kenya that takes place there that we're sending monthly support to Meshach Omidney over there, ministering there in Kenya. We, we support Forgotten Ministries as a church here monthly. Uh, Jeremiah and Sarah Harian with all they do, all, you know, ministering to the marginalized. We, we support that. We have, we're, we're trying to get a youth center up and running. There's just been a lot of roadblocks. We, we, we're gaining some ground now. We just, we, we, there's just some work got to be done. That, and the whole purpose of that is to show mercy and to bring reconciliation to young people and in our community. But let me tell you, church, there's a lot more hurting people out there. A lot more hurting people out there. And, and there's been a lot of people point fingers at the church, say, why aren't you helping people more and more? Hey, I, we're doing everything we can right now. But if you see areas and hurting people that we can help, don't be just one of those pastors, you need to do this. Help meet the need. And we'll partner with you to help the hurting. See, if everything's got to be driven from the top down, we're going to be very uh, handicapped as a church. But what would happen if every one of us started living this message? And we're here to help, don't get me wrong. 
This is where we need your help. I think we need to do better at this. I think we, do, we can do more at this. Amen. But it's gonna take all of us. We've got our Feed the Neighborhood event coming up here August the 9th. This is a big annual event that we've done for this year's 20 years. Man, I was so excited about 2020, gonna be our 20th year. We're gonna have a big celebration, but guess what? 2020 is the year of the unexpected. I think that's what 2020 is. <laughs> I'm not talking about in a good way. I'm believing for the last half to be in a good way because the first half was like, dear Lord, what happened? <laughs> but because of the restrictions of COVID, we're, 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 we're gonna defeat the neighborhood still. We're gonna be giving away, however, what, 2,000 backpacks or what are 1,500 backpacks, but it's gonna have to be a drive-through. We're not gonna be able to do the great big celebration event like we've had, having thousands of people in a packed area. We're not gonna be able to do that this year. So we're gonna have to save a big celebration hopefully for next year. But what is the purpose of that? It's mercy, it's showing mercy. The real love of God in that. Let me close with this. Again, church, you can tell I'm, I'm passionate right now about this. I'm passionate about this. Because I see too much of the divisiveness going on in the church today. Too much of this pharisaical spirit going on in the church today. Y'all remember the story where I think I've got the scripture up there in John, John chapter eight. Y'all remember the story of the woman who was caught in the literal act of adultery? She was caught in the very act. In other words, she was caught in bed with somebody committing adultery. And the religious leaders bring her out there before Jesus. And they say, Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act. And they said, you know, the law says she must be stoned. <laughs> so they look at Jesus and said, Jesus, what should happen to her? Y'all remember that story? I'm getting ready to tell you, read you Jesus' response. This is actually trying to trap Jesus. But if we're gonna take a real Jesus to a real world and we're gonna be about justice, mercy, faith, restoration, Reconciliation. then I think we should pattern what we do from what Jesus did. Anybody else with me? Huh. It says, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. Let me, let me just back up for just a second. So they asked Jesus what should happen to her. The story goes that Jesus, he just bent down and he started riding in the ground. Just, I don't, there's a lot of theories he could have been doodling in the sand or he could have been writing, the, one of the guys' name was Stone Bob and writing out the sin that he had just committed. I don't know. We don't know. All we know is Jesus, he just didn't respond. He's just doing something. And it says one by one, they were convicted of their sins and they began to walk away. Let me, let me back up. Jesus' response was this. He that hath not sinned, let him cast the first stone. He that hath not sinned, let him cast the first stone. And then he starts doodling in the sand. One by one, they leave. And this is what he looks up and he says, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw that no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Man, there's condemning earlier there, weren't they? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said to her, I want you to hear what Jesus said. What did he say? Neither do I. But Jesus, she was caught in sin. She was doing what was wrong. Jesus, what did Jesus say? I don't condemn you either. You know what he said to her? Go, and he just simply said this. Stop sinning. Don't sin anymore. Don't sin. Wow. That's a profound response. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Man, Father, I, this is just what you started in my heart to bring, Lord God. Lord, help us. Help us to show the, the real love of you. Lord, we don't, we don't want to, don't want to be like the Pharisees. So judgmental. Judging everything. Always pointing their fingers at others, but never looking at themselves. 
God, you've called us to the ministry of reconciliation, to show mercy, to make right th- wrong things right, to believe in you, Lord God, to bring reconciliation. So, Lord, I just pray that you help every one of us to live this message today, whatever that looks like, Lord God, whatever that looks like. We want to be you to our hurting world around us. Thanks again for listening. We hope that this message inspires, challenges, and fuels you up to take a real Jesus to a real world. If you'd like to connect with us in any way, please go to harvestunited.com slash connect. Or if you'd like to learn more about us as a church, please go and check us out at harvestunited.com. We can't wait to share another message with you next week.